Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, folks, on the episode, on the show today, I have Adam Robinson, the inventor of Twerk Work. Now, I know Adam from festivals. I know him specifically from the dance floor. I've had so many good dances with Adam. And I just realized as I was researching this particular episode over the last week that I haven't really had that many conversations with him. And I didn't really know that much about him. I, I knew he was an amazing dancer. And I knew that he had created to work work. And from my perspective, that was enough to get him on the show. I have since discovered that Adam is a neurosomatic facilitator, a public speaker, and a coach. He knows trauma resolution inside out. Um, he does harvening, which is a specific uh, modality. And I've been listening to other podcasts that he's done where he's talked a lot around yeah, trauma, how, how it uh, orientates in the body, how it lands in the body, how it resolves, et cetera, et cetera. And he has a fascinating personal journey and so in this podcast my intention is to talk to him more about his own journey rather than about his areas of expertise um some of the things I've learned about Adam from reading his website good handy things at websites is that he experienced a child custody battle as a child like he was the child in, in that so he went through the the family court and had that experience uh, when he was just shy of his 13th birthday, his older brother committed suicide, um, prompted by anti-acne medicine, which is quite similar to SSRIs, which actually increase the chance of suicide. Um, we're talking like things like Prozac, um, something that I have direct personal experience of as well, because back in the early 90s, right when Prozac was first coming out, my auntie was put on Prozac and committed suicide a few weeks later so this happened for Adam that's you know like a big landmark event and when he was 20 he came out as gay to his mum and said he felt incredibly liberated uh, he was engaged in his early 20s to his boyfriend for about a year just a fascinating journey and then went through as we all do in some way shape or form a period of darkness where he just decided he was going to sort of shit out and anchor into all the epic wellness and health and turn his life around really which he's now done and he's got an amazing business he does so much good work with so many incredible people and I'm so excited to talk to him about all the things because of course we're going to talk about sexuality we're going to talk about spirituality we'll probably talk a little bit around power and awakening I'm really curious to know what his take is on awakening. So let's dive into the conversation. As always, stay right to the end. I'll have some reflections at the end. And uh, let's see what Adam has to say. Adam Robertson, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> oh, I'm thrilled to have a conversation with you because as I mentioned in my introduction, we've mostly talked via dance and, and via those energetic, you know, it felt like we didn't need to exchange many words. We were just kind of vibing in, in the festivals. Um, to start with, where in the world are you and what, what room are you in? Because I can see some beautiful artifacts behind you. Yeah, so I'm actually based in Katikati now, which is like just out of Tauranga in like the Bay of Plenty. So this is like my base. Um, I used to live in like Wellington, but the weather was a little bit too much for me. So I was like, off I go, like back to the Bay of Plenty. Um, but the room that I'm actually in, this is technically supposed to be like the lounge but I converted it more to like just a I like to call it just like a chill out zone a space where you can just be come and be held and be nourished and mm. set up a little like altar with all my beautiful things that just mean like a lot to me and I I just sit with them most most days and 
Mm. Yeah, it's just nice to, I always feel very present and very held in this space. Yeah, I can feel it. Like just, I mean, I feel like I'm staring at an altar. It's like, oh, we're dropping into practice. We've got that space here. Oh, all right. So the question I'm starting to ask everyone to kick things off in recognition that we all perceive reality differently is what's your worldview? What's the lens with which you perceive reality? What is the lens in which I perceive reality? In the current like space that I am in within my life, I feel like to me it's really understanding that there is one thing that connects us all together and there is one thing which happens to be the same thing which often separates us all apart. And to me, the, that thing is like our trauma, right? Like if we were to look at everyone within like this world and to understand like those that have been incarcerated, those in prisons, if we were to look at those that are that are homeless, if we were to look at those that are, you know, everywhere and anywhere in between that whole realm of just humanity, um, the thing that often keeps us separated and judging one another is like our own trauma, our, our traumatic experiences, the things that we hold on to and the things that we allow to define us. And we don't necessarily take the time to reflect on how that is reflected to us through mm. a person, right? Through a mirror. But also understanding that if we all got together in like this massive circle and we were to ask ourselves like this question of like, you know, um, like, is this something that you've experienced in your life? And for everyone who had experienced these certain things, they took like a step closer into the circle. Like most of us would be right there in the center. And, and that's understanding that these are things that connect us as well and they don't they don't need to define us and they don't need to separate us we can actually learn to have compassion through our, our experience and when you see someone in a different space or a different a different thing that is maybe not where you are or where you ever want to be you can understand that it's actually an experience that has led them to that point and you have been through your own experience that has led you to a point but often we have linked experiences which we don't really explore mm. can you define that last little bit we have linked experiences that we don't feel, really explore yeah so I feel like for a lot of us like a linked experience could be the fact that we were smacked as a child Mm -hmm. right and like mm -hmm. a lot of us may have that experience and so it's to me like a linked experience it's a it's a very like common thread of a, a, an experience that a lot of us have have a, a, like suffered or experienced but we don't explore that we don't necessarily go oh oh same with me mm. actually a level of compassion to maybe why it is that this has led you here in this mm -hmm. space yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Like, you know, I know you've done a lot of work with people. I've done a lot of work, sat in a lot of circles. And the thing that I notice most often is that people start to realize after being in circle at a retreat for two or three days that, oh, shit, everyone's got shit. And not only does everyone have shit, but we all have, in essence, like you're saying, the same shit. Like, yeah. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm afraid to be loved. Da, da, da. It's like everyone, same thing, same thing same thing mm. and I think I think we forget that and then we end up judging that within other people yeah but it's like it's actually a reflection of often like I always say judgment is merely an, like an unwillingness to accept or express that part of yourself mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. mm. so I know you've done a lot of personal work uh, when you look back on your childhood what were because the thing with trauma right is it can be very very small things that people think oh what or it can be bigger things that people are like well of course um, when you reflect on your childhood what are the standout moments where trauma was generated recognizing it's not the event per se it's the meaning that we attribute to the event that will generate the trauma so 
I guess so you're you're like the question is like what are the what are the moments yeah recognizing it could be a really little thing you know or it could be a really big thing like it's not always the big stuff that people think you know people oh trauma is this really big stuff it's like not necessarily it's what gets laid down and, and imprinted in the system absolutely I feel like for me like in looking at trauma and and traumatic experiences in my life a lot of them have been quite big and so I don't really have the the information like the conscious information of maybe small Mm. events that have happened in my experience because um you know when when we go through often traumatic experiences that that it, we, we go into like this mechanism of like hypervigilance how amygdala like you know goes off and we it just it's all about safety and so a lot of the time we blur out other other situations um mm-hmm. other experiences that may be smaller yet significant or maybe really like happy and significant but like we forgot those right <laughs> yeah so, um for me like definitely there was like a couple of different factors like one one of them I grew up with a very like abusive father um and so from a really young age I just remember certain like times of being like hit and like repetitively like threatened and um yelled at and all forms of that I felt very unsafe within my environment and and someone who brought me a lot of safety was my mum and because my my um parents were separated I I I wasn't even allowed to like talk to my mum or call my mum when I was at my dad's house and so in in the experiences where I felt really unsafe the only person that I really wanted to be around was my mum and I didn't even have that and the times in which I tried to like sneakily like call her I was like found out and I would get like punished or reprimanded for that as well so it was this very like ongoing sort of process of just constant abuse when I was in that environment often Mm -hmm. um and then on the other kind of like spectrum of that abuse was also just like negligence of parenting yeah Um, and you know it's it's not necessarily not saying that I I didn't like go through these experiences but I can also realize that my father knew what he knew in that time and that was how he operated you know so I can put a level of compassion as an adult but as like a as a child you don't realize that and and whether or not you're an adult or a child that sort of stuff is not acceptable you know but I can understand that that was all that he really knew how to and yeah. that's the only way to part of parent, you know? Yeah. Um, and that so, raises the question too of like how was he brought up as a child and what were his unresolved traumas and what about his parents and their you know, and, and so it goes. <laughs> yeah, and I actually like um probably like six months a year ago I asked him that question because I was really fascinated because like I've as an adult I've I've been able to come into a lot of my my power and myself and and move past and through those experiences and really stand up for myself within that relationship to the point where I can actually just be like hey this is me or like this is a question that I ha- have or like this is what I experienced like why was it that I experienced this like what was it with like how did you grow up you know like I became fascinated in like understanding the the sort of intergenerational trauma yeah did he answer was he able to answer he he mentioned that for him growing up like his like he said that he had like a really good upbringing mm-hmm. but he also mentioned that like smacking was a very normalized thing you know yeah. like you just do what you're told and if you don't you get smacked and he he like he still believes to this day that that is like the way like the way to get people to like respond yeah. and listen to you and I'm just like hey like that is not the way but if like <laughs> there's no way that I can change that so like look yeah. just accept that that's your thing and I'm gonna just move past that because I don't need to be involved in that you know yeah 
it's so fascinating i find is that so you had an experience as a child that was scary you would you would just you know you were scared like you say so this the whole system's in fight or or flight there's the hypervigilance there's all of those things and yet from the parents perspective they you know they're doing what they think is the best thing to do the right thing to do that's going to instill discipline or is going to instill obedience or is going to and it's so fascinating that that can simultaneously be happening where they feel as if they're doing the right thing and it's having a detrimental impact on the child yeah yeah um I feel like you know even with it I I guess it's not like I guess it's like this unconscious part of them which doesn't realize that their behavior is wrong and even in like things like outside of like the abuse I remember going through the like court system at a really young age um, yeah it was probably around I want to say eight or nine and I I just remember having multiple different lawyers and the reason that I had that is because like I would have one lawyer and then I would be sharing like this is why I don't want to like live with my dad anymore like how is it that I can live with my mom this is why I want to live with my mom and they weren't listening to me and then I was just like what's the fucking point in this and then I'd be like hey can I get a new lawyer so I'd have a new lawyer I'd have to rehash this all out again and it, it felt like as a child the system was against me it really felt like the system was against me like no one actually wanted to acknowledge what I was experiencing and they were just making up their own sort of like minds about what was best for me and I went like I feel like I went through that for at least like maybe a year it could be longer I'm not sure the like actual time frame of it mm -hmm. but I just remember like within that experience and there was there's like one memory that like comes to mind and it was it's it's funny because I didn't know at the time but um like I think it was the day after or the day after that I was supposed to be like sitting with the judge and actually telling the judge like how I felt and what I wanted in my experience and I went home this eve that evening a couple of days before that was supposed to happen and I went home to my dad's and I remember him distinctively saying to me, why would you do this? Like you, like you don't love me. Like you don't like, clearly if you don't want to be here, you don't love me. Like blah, 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 blah. And just using this form of manipulation to, for whatever intention he had, mm. you know? And I, and I remember as a child that being like a big thing is like, I, and and now that I realize as an adult and looking into trauma, like the attachment that we have to our parents and the security that that attachment creates, it's like if we're being told by like a parent that we we don't love them, that like, you know, we're the ones that are the problem, which was a huge thing as part of like my childhood experience was being blamed for like everything that was going on within his life. I decided the next day to just go to like my lawyer and just say I've had enough I can't do this anymore like I just can't be part of this I like don't even care <laughs> and it did not work in my favor because I ended up living with my dad more frequently like how does that oh. even work? yeah um, oh. and yeah it was it's <laughs> yeah yeah it's so challenging to to go through and I also think of your dad and what he was experiencing with a child that's, you know, going to court and lawyers and judges and saying, I don't want to live. Like, you know, he might have been unconscious of it, but did that feel like rejection? Did that, like, how was that impacting him on that emotional level? And then, of course, if he's externalizing that, he's not aware of it, he's externalizing, he's blaming you for how he's feeling. <laughs> oh, humans, humans, yeah. humans. <laughs> Oh, so how, where are you at with it all now with the work that you've done when you, from this vantage point, look back on that time in your life when you were eight, nine, 10, how does it make you feel now? Like I look back to it and I, like, I feel at peace with it. I can, like, I can understand the experience and the experience that I've, like, that I've been through and I don't really hold any, like, grudges towards that. Um, mm. I really did for a, like a really long time 
and then there was like a point in my life where I just thought to myself like a what's like my intention of holding on to this yeah and be like what is this actually like doing for me like how is it affecting me is it bringing me happiness is it bringing me like sadness is it causing more grief is it causing more anger like and that's like that realization in itself really helped me to like release a lot of that because I was so angry for a really long time not only just because of that but because of like other experiences that I went through as well in my life um that even in that time I was like grieving and I was grieving the loss of my brother and then like you know um having that grief compounded with just like anger and like for example my dad just moving to Australia and me wanting to go and talk to him about everything that had happened when I was like 14 and then him not being there and I'm just like okay where the fuck you gone like you know (laughs) Um, (laughs) and and I just held on to a lot of anger and I actually realized that a lot of that anger that I was holding on to and a lot of the reason that I continued to establish and hold a relationship with him was out of like my own manipulative intent Mm. and that was like a big thing that I had to like overcome myself because I was like he's hurt me so much so like I'm gonna hold on to this relationship in order to and when he passes away I'll get his I'll get his stuff I'll be entitled to like those things that he took from me you know what I mean and that was like a really fascinating thing for me to like realize that I was like holding on to like this idea of like materialism because of what he had done to me like Mm -hmm. emotionally and physically Mm -hmm. so you've kind of felt like he owed you and you were going to do what it took to get because how dear right that's exactly Exactly. It was like, it was like this, you've taken things from me, you've taken things from other people, I'm going to make sure that I take those back Mm -hmm. for myself and for others, Mm -hmm. and like do better with it. But Mm -hmm. then I'm actually I'm holding on to that, that I was just fueling this fire and like eating myself inside and like, just holding on to unnecessary anger that was just causing so much dis-ease. And so was there like a critical point in your life when you had that realization? Did it come to a head? Like what kind of coping mechanisms were you using or distractions with all the anger and that kind of thing happening? Oh, coping mechanisms and distractions. I'm so good at that when I was young. (laughs) I mean, to be honest, like, so I I lost my brother when I was, when I was 12 as well. And so like, uh, I had like a lot of grief. So I remember you know even at school having those stress balls Mm -hmm. and I would probably go through like a stress ball per day or per two days because like I was just like shredding it eating it like just doing like everything to just like get this intense anger and emotion out of my system and I noticed that in school like I was like incredibly like disruptive and like just not really cooperative but also like understanding that they didn't understand me at the time either they didn't like necessarily yeah. see me, the experiences that I had been through just as this child that was causing like a lot of disruption if that makes sense and yeah it's something that I I look at so like with a whole different sense of compassion as an adult towards children now like yeah it's like what have they been through that's causing maybe that disruption or them to to behave or act like that and understanding that that's okay it's just an expression of something that they're moving yeah. or gone through but you know at 18 I like um started smoking and like that was like my my like escape mechanism that was like my way out like and mm-hmm. it was really interesting because before that I was very much like a no like smoking is disgusting like I would never do it and then like I just take it up and I'm like yes this is the best thing ever you know yeah but I, I mean think- it makes sense like I mean smoking my understanding and I've investigated because I've had periods of smoking in my life with etc and someone once said to me they're like oh you do realize that people reach for a smoke when they need to suppress emotion that's starting to surface. Um, and I was like, oh, is it really that direct? 
And so I just started to track it. I was really curious because I didn't identify as a smoker at all. But if I'd hang out with someone who was smoking, then I would have a drag or whatever. So I started to track when I had the, had the urge. And I was like, oh, it's because there is emotion coming. Oh, it's because I feel vulnerable. Oh, 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 oh. And just noticing that correlation was really intriguing. So it kind of makes sense if you've got all this emotion that hasn't yet been resolved. That's my fire alarm. That's your fire alarm? See, we're talking about smoking and the alarm's going off. No. Hey, hold on. Let me just undo that. So that doesn't like <laughs> There is no fire in the house. It's just a conversation yeah, around. Just, don't worry, everyone. We're okay. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Uh, that's all good. So there you are. You're 18. You've never wanted to smoke. You're starting to smoke. Any other behaviors that you started to notice? coming in as a result of unresolved trauma yeah like and and on the point of what you just shared and in, in yeah. regards pressed emotions and smoking i also uh what i came to realize is tobacco originally is really used as like a grounding medicine yeah. so when like I, i've realized that as an adult that every time that i went to like smoke it was often because i felt really like ungrounded in like my in my being like I didn't feel necessarily like very connected and so that was like also my way to like ground into like whatever was going on so mm. yeah and then like there were things like alcohol and then like gambling and all all different sorts of things and like my more so like my adulthood of from sort of 18 onwards that I turned to rather than beforehand it was more just like stressfuls and just like really like um just not aggression a lot of aggression a lot of rage a lot of like just don't fuck with me because like I'll hurt you like just this mm. real deep like um yeah internal yeah. rage that would just come out and and burst then it would just be projected upon like whoever was there or like I remember even in high school like one of my best friends getting bullied and I I went up to the bully and I was just like if you ever like touch her again like you're gonna regret it like just very threatening behavior uh -huh. because of, like, this it, was, it had to go somewhere and it just happened to like be here here and there um and then I, I and then I came across all of these <laughs> coping mechanisms <laughs> which makes and, sense you know that instead of just suppressed that and made me feel like in that moment that something was fixed <laughs> yeah so what I'm what I'm curious about just listening to you in terms of feeling a lot of rage etc and then when you're talking about your dad before was it rage that he was dealing with when you talked about it feeling abusive No, I don't necessarily like I would I wouldn't be able to tell you if it was if it was rage or not or if it was just anger and aggression and manipulation but it's yeah. really interesting because the links that I that I've put together and even in doing like my own sort of shadow work and understanding like the parts of me that I really didn't want to necessarily like accept or like that I wasn't looking at is like I was like, oh, there's actually like this deep part of me, which is like very manipulative that comes from my father that if like, that lies like within me that as like this child or teenager, especially between sort of the ages of like 13 to 18 or even 20, that I noticed that I could like at any point be like quite manipulative in like my approach towards things that I acknowledge actually like is this part of me that is also part of him that I didn't necessarily yeah. want to like accept or be like oh I could be like him but I'm like oh well there's actually certain aspects that are like are within him that are within me it's just mm. my choice whether or not I learn to like heal those or deal with those or understand those or notice the triggers or whatever it may be and I think that's a big thing within like um within humanity and life is like looking at looking at ourselves 
in like the context of the things that we don't necessarily believe to be true about us mm. that cause a lot of like um emotional turmoil when someone says something to us that could like trigger that like if someone says to you oh you're a blue elephant you're not going to necessarily like respond in a manner which you're going to be like okay yeah, cool. really what makes yeah. you say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you're> like, <laughs> <laughs> but if someone says like you're really manipulative and you go I'm not fucking manipulative like how do you often there's like this underlying like thing and I realized through that like oh actually I am this and I am this and I am this and I am this and that's yeah. actually okay it's just whether or not like I decide to heal that or how I decide to like express that or like the work that I'm doing on that or if I mm. just use it in a way that is just unhealthy and do the, yeah. do the same process as someone else did to me mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it makes so much sense right it's just owning it and dissolving it right um so there you are you coming through your teen years you've had the stuff with your dad and the child custody and then your brother passing when you were 12 almost 13 what was it like for you as a teenager with sexuality yeah it's sexuality is like a fascinating thing for me because like growing up I like I didn't really like I wasn't exposed to like anything outside of like heterosexuality I was like okay man and woman like that's that's, it. that's how it's supposed to be yeah you know <laughs> like that's the way of life um and it wasn't until like if I look into like my conscious memory, it probably wasn't until like maybe nine or 10 where I had like explorative thoughts about like the other sex um, or uh, the same sex, I should say, as like yeah. myself. And then I was like, oh, like what's that? And then going to high school, it was really interesting because I've always had like quite a higher pitched voice. Mm -hmm. I was really bullied for having like this high pitched voice and people were like you're gay you're gay you're gay and like gay was always like this negative thing yeah. it was like you never wanted to be that because like people would call you like a like a faggot and gay and yeah. all of these sorts of things and this is were... when you started high school or was this earlier in school years like well so in high school then earlier yeah. in school years to be honest because like earlier in school years like I had like attraction to girls and like I don't know like I was like like I would kiss a girl in the backfield you know when yeah, you're yeah, like yeah. 11 or 12 and you're doing your thing and so like I don't necessarily know if that it was really like relevant so much then but yeah. as soon as I got into high school I noticed it a lot more and so even in myself I was like well actually no like I've had like thoughts about the same sex but I haven't necessarily like full-on blowing like gone yeah mm. so for me I was like well no I'm not gay like I'm straight like that's mm -hmm. who I am like I've kissed girls I've done all of those things so that's like my experience and um I, I like I had girlfriends in high school and all of that but like I noticed that as years progressed I was like more curious mm. and so I was like oh, okay and then I was like maybe like I'm bisexual like mm -hmm oh, that's okay. And I only told my like very tight knit friends who would be understanding because I was still like to the rest of the world. I was like, no, I'm straight. Like don't yeah. call me out. Like I'm still straight. Like not going to tell them, you know, because otherwise it proves that they were somewhat right or like, you know, it was like always protecting myself. And it wasn't until maybe like 18 19 that I was like oh I actually really think that I'm just attracted to like guys like yeah I actually have no interest in girls whatsoever <laughs> um, sorry and, ladies sorry yeah. ladies <laughs> and I'm like guys are the, like the the way to go and then yeah at 20 I got into like my first same-sex relationship and um like even and even coming out to my mom was like a very nerve-wracking thing to do I was like oh my god what is she gonna think like blah 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 and me and my mom have always had a very close relationship but he, like still just like because again at that time it wasn't it wasn't really an accepted thing like it, so it, when were you at, at high school like what was the time frame 
Are we talking two so, thousands or uh, you're like twenty seven now, right? Yeah, so I left high school in two thousand and thirteen. So I was in high school from two thousand and eight. Yeah. To two thousand and thirteen. Yeah. And in two thousand and fifteen, when I was twenty, like I like same sex marriage wasn't a thing. Like you yeah. know, it was still sort of like it was like yeah, there was no real openness about it. Yeah. There was no about it it's interesting Um, because I grew up in the 80s and 90s and of course in the 90s all of a sudden you had like Will and Grace and you had Alan DeGeneres and and so there was a sense in the 90s that it was becoming more visible and becoming more accepted and becoming but listening to your experience I'm like wow it didn't really filter down to New Zealand high schools (laughs) And what's curious too, like I have a son at high school right now and I listen to the way that him and his buddies talk and they use the word gay and faggot in a derogatory way. And no matter what I say to them, you know, no matter how I try and approach the subject, they're still doing that. And it's like, really? Like, yeah. So it's interesting for me to hear of your experience because my sense coming through the 90s was that society was shifting and it was way more accepted and way more ease but that's not necessarily reflected in your direct experience particularly at high school yeah yeah no it went like it's it and it's fascinating that you like that you say that because like yeah to to me like none of those things were relevant in like my experience like even even maybe to people who had watched those I don't know like I don't know if if my parents had ever watched like you know those yeah. those tv shows or whatever but nothing around me indicated that it was safe to be who I was and it was safe mm. to like, be gay or have something that like just wasn't standard you know yeah. um and so telling my mum was like a huge step and like she was very exiting she was just like oh yeah I kind of like maybe thought that and like I was like oh okay (laughs) she's like yeah I was just waiting for you to tell me (laughs) um, but I did like I didn't tell my dad um at all because I was just like this is not something that I have like interest in telling him um and it probably wasn't until maybe I was 24 that I told him um and that was even like after I had been engaged and everything like that um just because I just didn't necessarily want him part of like anything to do with my life. So I was like, what's yeah. it? Well, he hasn't really earned the right necessarily, right? For you to yeah. share your vulnerability and your heart with them. Um, so, so what's your direct experience now as a gay man in New Zealand? Does it feel safe? Is it something that you ever think? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating. Like we talk about being a very progressive um, country and I never feel comfortable within my own skin being like a gay man here in New Zealand like either like the Bay of Plenty it's very um old school old-fashioned like I I mean like I could walk out in like a zebra print, print shirt and people would like look at me weirdly you know like um I've I've traveled all around the country and like there is that no particular point that I feel like often safe and just being myself like I have a partner now and and we like hold hands on the street and that's a very like big thing for me because like I've never felt comfortable doing that and I still feel like people are looking and I still feel like you know you do you do get looks like it's not something that you make up like people literally look at you like strangely and I'm just like are you fucking joking like 2023 like get on with your life do whatever you need to do and leave me to just like I'm not hurting anyone I'm not doing anything wrong yeah you're just showing Um, love (laughs) like you this is me in love and it you know yeah yeah and I also don't necessarily feel like I fit into a lot of spaces either Mm. and that's a really like that's been a big thing for me it's like I growing up in high school I had a lot of female friends I didn't really talk to a lot of guys I didn't 
just out of complete fear because a lot of the time the people that were bullying me me were were guys you know yeah um and like even in my friendships now I probably have like one male friend or two male friends all the rest of my friends are female but I often feel like very isolated within society Mm -hmm. um, because I and I I've I've spoken to like and I shared this on on my um social media as well as that I and I don't relate to necessarily like women's groups and I don't necessarily relate to men's groups and then I have differing opinions to um sometimes like the LGBT community and then so then they're like well why are you supporting us and then I then go let's talk about like inclusivity and uh, and things like that and then like the people are like oh well you're too like pushy of like your LGBT and I'm like fuck we are oh I look my like, god like, <laughs> you can't win like I just can't win and like this is and so often I just feel like isolated to like okay like I'm just gonna keep sharing my message and doing my thing and like but it feels like often a lonely road yeah fuck yeah I mean just I mean I yeah I just want to honor you Adam and your journey and that and just not feeling safe to be you as you are and to express as you are like yeah it's just fucked up and particularly because it's other people's shit it's other people's uncomfortable feeling around their own sexuality or their own preferences or other people's it's other people's stuff that's getting projected outward it's fascinating like talking to people who have been to New Zealand from overseas Mm. visited here who live overseas that they even feel like New Zealand is not as progressive as some areas overseas where like they feel really comfortable just being with like their partner of the same sex and walking the streets and holding hands and kissing in public or doing things like that and yet they just feel like completely not safe here in New Zealand I'm like that's really fascinating for me like because we always talk about like New Zealand being like a really like beautiful place and like accepting place and all of these things and that's not necessarily like a lot of people's experience and and yeah just like there's a lot of fear in this country there's a lot of fear people are afraid of gay people they're afraid of trans people they're afraid of other ethnicities they're afraid of Maori you know look at the stop co-governance it's like so much fear that's yeah yeah yeah, I mean, we were the first country to give women the vote, but that doesn't mean that, like you say, that we are as progressive as we like to think, necessarily. Yeah. 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 How do you find the transformational festivals? Because you are on the festival circuit, you bring your magic, your mahi to the festival circuit. How do you feel in those spaces as a gay man? Um, and be honest, like, if you need to call yeah. them to account, I, I'm, yeah. I'm down. <laughs> yeah like I I still don't really feel like it's as as inclusive as it could be um I have written some like some uh constructive feedback to these to these spaces like sharing that like for example if you're going to have like a men's circle and if you're going to have a woman's circle that it would be great to just have like a co-ed space like space where like people who maybe don't necessarily want to go to either or can just like go there and share you know because like even talking to people within these festivals there is this underlying current of like not necessarily everyone feeling included yeah but no one's talking about it yeah I'm just like this is fucked up like that we're in like this space that is supposed to be about sharing and about love and about inclusivity and about spirituality and all of these things and about you know I don't know like being more conscious yeah and not more conscious like we're we're literally like living in our own little world of consciousness that isn't necessarily like open and inclusive and can often be very clicky as well and I'm just like we really need to just change up the field here and just like notice these things that and 
and people don't always necessarily feel comfortable either sharing this sort of feedback because yeah. they'll be like, oh, well, like what happens if then like they hate me or like what happens if like that got like, you know, I'm not then like liked by these people. And that's a very like deeply rooted like abandonment wound of like majority of people. That comes back to like even like tribal like days of just being different and getting completely pushed out of a tribe yeah. and being isolated and dying because you don't have the food and the water and the like community, you know? Yeah. And the fact that this is not really understood, I'm just a bit baffled by. Yeah. I think it's great that we can talk about it here. And, and so when you did give feedback to some of the festivals, was it received? Was it responded to? No. Okay. That's a major fail, Transformational Festival organizers. If you are watching this, if feedback comes in, please receive, please respond. <laughs> um, I was part of, at a festival this year, I was part of leading a women's circle and there was a men's circle at the same time. And um, one of the women that was leading the women's circle, she identifies as gay. And we had, we had a bit of, not a lot of conversation, but there was conversation around well, who gets to decide? Who decides who's a man, who's a woman? And and what about people that don't fit, you know? So we tried to frame it as it's a circle for those who identify as women or identify as men. But I can still see that even trying to frame it in that way and trying to hold it in that way was limiting or was lacking. And it was still quite binary. You know, there was still that sense of men here, women here. And even if it's framed in that way, I imagine the amount of courage that it might take for someone to cross the line as such or to show up or would be, it's still putting the onus on other people to step into the inclusivity, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And and it's fascinating because like, even within like the binary, it's like, so I, and this, this is like a whole subject in itself, you know, um, but to me it's like we like we we're we're trying to do the same thing we just we don't just we don't recognize that within each other like in in current society and reality and what's going on with like binary and and non-binary and fl yeah. fluidity and all of these things i feel like on one hand um if we acknowledge that like there is binary but what the issue with this binary system is is that we have the sort of gender stereotypes of things like we have the the gender conditioning of things yeah this and is what we, a man is this is what a woman <laughs> very yeah. narrow we break that down yeah. We don't necessarily need to worry about any of it because we have worked through the fact that I could be a man and I could be doing Any expression. What... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that wouldn't be a problem. And like someone else could be a woman and any expression and that wouldn't be a problem either. And I think that's what we're both like both parties are trying to get to, just in different ways. And I feel like there's like this conflict between mm -hmm. it where I feel like maybe the same, the mission is the same. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for everyone, but this is like that the mission is the same. We just don't necessarily see, see that, you know? Yeah. I feel like what we need to do is break down the, the, the sort of conditions and constructs of what it looks like to be a man, that you have to be like a tradie and you have to like the color blue and you have to go to the gym and be buff and, you know, do all of these things. Cause that is very much like the condition of like what I've grown up to is like a yep. representation of a man. Yeah. I don't or the rugby to... stereotype or the surface stereotype or whatever variation, but it's still a stereotype of what it means to be a man. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I don't fit into that, but I'm still a man. Like I still, like I still consider myself a man. I'm just not that man, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, cool. Where, where do I go? You know, yeah. Where do I go? It's like everything's being catered to like the stereotypical like condition of what it's like to be like a man, but that's not it. Because I don't like I. I'm not a woman, and I don't yeah. want to be. 
you know i like i'm happy being who i am i just want to be who i am in my in my own skin with um, my own expression and know that that's okay yeah i love i really love fluidity you know like when i see people when i see humans and i'm like whoa is that man or is that woman what humor it's human it's freaking human and an expression that we can no longer perceive according to the conditioning whether it's man or woman and i just it really delights me because of course so much of what i'm all about is dissolving conditioning so when i look at what's happening in the last decade five years two years around the binary non-binary the expansion that I really feel like we've been called to break through identity where we start to know ourselves as human. Mm. First and foremost, human. And then there might be our sexuality and then there might be our ethnicity and then there might all of these different things that really are not who we are. Um, and so I see it too from that perspective that it's helping to break the conditioning that's really strong. Like, I don't know, I've done some internal work and started to realize um, how identified I was with woman. It's like, what's beyond that? If I really drop into in a somatic way, like a direct experience of beyond womanness, what does that feel like? What is that? And it was so incredibly liberating to go beyond that. Um, that's my little riff on identity politics. Yeah, and I, and I love having conversations like these because I feel like with conversations like these where it doesn't need to be argumentative or it doesn't need to be um, anger-oriented or, like, you know, projected, that in these conversations with one another where we're just sharing, like, this is, like, my understanding, this is my perception, what's your understanding and your perception yeah. and what's your understanding and your perception that like we can all just begin to sort of like be like oh okay and like I have a question about this and like what would like what would you like what do you think about that and like to me that's like just that should be simple like adult <laughs> like <laughs> the way <laughs> But unfortunately, like we are very emotionally charged, especially when it comes to like our identity. And I always say like anytime that we att attach anything to our identity, no matter what it is, materialistic, non-materialistic, like all of that, it, it, we, we just feed like the emotional attachment to it. And anytime we feed our identity and anytime that potentially we ourselves or someone tries to remove that identity it feels like death like yeah. it literally feels like yes. we're dying and yes. then what we do our system goes into like shock we just like completely like go out and like no like our ego takes over we're just like no I've got to protect everything that I've held yeah. on to for so long yeah. and in that we're like missing like what's underneath that yes so much yes to that and I think that in terms of conversations around this is understanding the way the psyche works, understanding the way identification works and exactly what you just said, when things are conflated with identity because of the internal death, you, you, you literally will defend to the death per se, the point you're trying to make because you're identified with it. So to let the point go is to kill yourself. Yeah. Um, the system actually doesn't know the difference between like, the death that you're experiencing and like actual like death death yeah yeah know? it's it's one and the same and so yeah. that's why when you say like I feel like I'm dying it's like a literal like thing like yeah yeah, yeah. that whole death and rebirth thing that people speak about like that that's a literal thing like when you're stripping away all of these layers of attachment and identity yeah. it can very much feel like that yeah so true I mean I would I would really love to see kind of the art of conversation where we like you said where we explore topics rather than debate argue try and figure out what's right and wrong because that's so last century paradigm you know and that's one of the reasons I started this podcast I'm like conversations where we can explore things there isn't a right or wrong there's no position to hold because the moment you hold a position, you're identified with it. The moment you're identified with it, you have to defend it to the death because that's how the psyche works. Um, yeah. 
Oh, oh. Just, can't, just can't. let's just take a moment because, like, <laughs> yes, <sighs> yeah. Oh. Hmm. So I don't want to let the transformational festivals off the hook yet. Um, so what would you love to see the transformational festivals? What could they do differently or how could they approach things or what would be beneficial before next summer season? Yeah, like for me, it is really like pushing themselves beyond like their, their norms, like what they're used yeah. to. Like getting... Um, alternative and different voices involved and also like alternative and different facilitators involved as well like often when I go to like I mean I've facilitated at these festivals and like great but also like often I see like I've been to multiple festivals multiple times and it's all it tends to always be mm -hmm. like this sort of like people that are facilitated yeah yeah it's the and, circuit right yeah I totally yeah. agree and I'm like, oh, but like, I know so many people who don't necessarily like get the credit that they're due, mm -hmm. that are like very fucking great at what they do. And they may, may never see like the same um, mar market promotion, whatever you, whatever you want to call it as someone else, because they can't, they can't get their foot in the door. So, like, first my invitation would be, like, <laughs> push yourself outside of, like, the normal of what you're used to just, like, accepting, even if it's going to potentially, like, backfire. Because not only is it, like, actually being in congruency to say what you want to be. Yeah, inclusive safe spaces. Hello. <laughs> but also, like, it's giving other people an opportunity to, like, present their magic you know yeah. and as someone who has attended both as a facilitator or as someone who has attended both as just like someone who wasn't facilitating and even outside of facilitating I just go and like be part of it it's like it gets boring <laughs> it yeah. gets boring having the same people there every time like if you want to expand your market like no one wants to look at your flyer and see oh I've been there 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 I've done that I've done that I've done that like yeah yeah. change it up yeah I mean open like maybe that that uh, if you if you have like a because I imagine that at these festivals they have like a group of consultants or or people that are like you know this is this is how it's going to go this is what we want to do like blah 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 blah. it's like get other voices in there mm. that represent necessarily what has being represented so far like yes still include that sure but also yeah. get with someone here and someone here and someone here that has differing perspectives as well because what I find and it's really fascinating and it's like even in the sort of like conscious awake spiritual whatever you want to call it community is when there is conflict hmm. when there is conflict of opinion it's taken very personally and I'm just like, well, hold on, conflict is actually a really good thing. Yeah. Like conflict gives us an ability to come to diplomacy, to come to mm. like, you know, expansion, to come to all of these different things that we get to realize that we don't necessarily may have, that we may not have necessarily consciously acknowledged or realized in what we've been used to. Yeah. So that would be my invitation. I like that. I like that because I think, I mean, the one thing about doing the workshop schedule um, is that people apply. And I do know, for example, you know, I think NZ Spirit will sometimes get 600 applications, right, coming in and and for like 200 slots or whatever. So there's huge work in going through all of those. And I know that the way that the mind works and patterns and familiarity, et cetera, that sometimes you, you just go in for you know, and this is not this is not an excuse in any way, shape, or form. It's just looking at the material reality of it. And I know that you know, Earthbeat, same thing. There's so much con um, conversation that goes on around who to include. And I also think it's absolutely vital that there is a conscious effort to include to be even more inclusive. 
even more inclusive. Um, and if anyone's watching this and you're you don't necessarily think about applying, apply. Right, put yourself forward, apply, and and don't just apply and leave it at that. Interact on the social media accounts with the organizers. Make yourself known, be seen, right? Bug them, you know, and and do that because I think if it can come from more than one side, right? So the organizers expand what they're doing as well, and other people go, "Fuck it, I'm going to be there and I'm going to deliver my thing, and I'm coming." <laughs> Takes two to tango, right? Takes two to tango, right? Yeah, for sure. Um. Mm, yeah and I just want to like just just say that like I'm very very grateful that like you that you have asked that because yeah that's not that's not necessarily something that like has ever been asked hmm. yeah so I just want to acknowledge you for actually like being like hey what do you think yeah. about this? like it's yeah. it's okay to have this conversation like you know because I, th I think it's a very necessary conversation yeah yeah I do too I do too um and it, yeah it feels important to me like I love the festivals oh. and I see their shadow and the weakness etc and I want them to be amazing um and I love humans yeah. really love humans and all of their myriad diverse permeations you know wow. and so that's what I want to see in the festival space is humans represented and yeah. if, if we can't do it in a transformational festival space how on earth do we expect regular society to start stepping up you know that thing we got to be the change and that and I really feel like what you said it requires first of all a desire and a willingness to go beyond and to stretch and to self-reflect on, oh, all our voices are sort of over here and there's all these other people here and let's expand and bring some of those voices in. What, what are we lacking? What are we missing? Who's not being represented here? Um, and it's an active thing that has to happen on the part of the organizers. Um, and I know how busy they are, but it's important. It's really important. Ah, so good to have all these chats. Is there anything else in particular that you want to talk about while you're here before we start to to wrap up anything else that's because this is the space um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I don't know there's so much I feel like when I come into these spaces and especially with someone like yourself that is so open to talking about it all there is so much to talk about right <laughs> so yeah. I yeah I I don't know what else there is to to bring into this conversation um so, oh twerk work we have to touch on twerk work that was the yes. main reason I, I reached yes. out to you <laughs> yes okay. both of us just forgetting completely <laughs> totally all right so you have I love it you've invented it you have created twerk work which is about so much more than dance moves right than about twerking give us the elevator pitch <laughs> yeah, so like, so twerk work is a, it's a psychosensory modality combining breath work and twerking together to basically empower individuals to help, um, you know, release trauma and do it in a really fun and dynamic way. So it's about community. It's about connection. It's about empowerment. It's about confidence. It's about fun. Like, and it's, it's different to a regular twerk class that you would just go to and learn about like the twerk movements, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with. Like, hey, go to yeah, totally. Two, like, but it's, it's different to learning about just the movements and then just trying to twerk it out and get the best twerk possible. And it's different to breath work and just trying to like, you know, do, do your breathing over here and different, different sorts of things here. It's like a combination where actually the focus is on connection to the body. The focus is on like coming into a sense of like safety and empowerment and love and respect and like just expression of like all that you are within this space and getting out of the mind because the mind is like amazing but the mind is also like that part of us which goes like you can't do this like you look ugly like blah 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 all of these like negative self-talk things go well actually 
let me just like shake that out. Let me just move it. Let me just like get it uh-huh. going. Yeah, you know, and it's just. Can, and you can, do it can we just do a tiny little bit? Can if we stand, oh. are you still going to be on camera? If I stand, I'm not. I'm not in the right like pants for this, but like <laughs> I can't. Okay, let's. Like let's your try. booty's on camera. Mine's kind of on camera. Hang on, I'm gonna like. What's right. so important is you keep your yep. butt straight and it's just like your hips that you're moving. So you're basically like tilting your pelvis forward. Uh-huh. Tilt your pelvis like, forward. Yep. Tilt the pelvis forward. So it's almost like sucking it through and then you're just going to flick it back. So tilt oh. it uh-huh. and, and flick it back. So uh-huh. We're not wanting to do like cat cows where we're moving the entire back. We want to keep the back as straight as possible and just move the pelvis. Move the pelvis. It's the flick. Because it's the cat cow movement. It's yeah. The, like, hold on. It's, let me see if I can get it like on camera. It's this <laughs> one where we go like curve. Yeah, the, yeah. Cat like that like hurts our back the most. Right. But so keeping the back straight back straight like there's gonna be a little bit of like cat cow but like nothing like too major it's just like tilting that pelvis i'm gonna keep the back oh oh that's the whole <laughs> yeah so it's like that's oh like, my god just, adam i just found the groove <laughs> <laughs> celebrate yes so oh. like getting that technique and then expanding on that technique. Uh-huh. And I always say to people, I always say to people, like, okay, so I want you to like tap into anything that like has been on your mind, any like emotion that is like fueling you at the, at the moment, like your neighbor who just like fucking pissed you off, uh-huh. like whatever it might be. Twerk it out. Twerk it out. Just like release it out of your like booty. <laughs> I'm just having waves of bliss. Can't just say I've got waves of bliss coming through. Cause I yeah, I just tapped into the twerk super yeah, highway. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, I feel it. And then mixing it with like breath work is really like like it's stimulating to the to the nervous system and in both like the the different breaths that we do we we help to tap into like the parasympathetic where we're creating safety within the like system but then we're also tapping into the sympathetic where we're creating like stress resilience where we're yeah you know noticing how we can actually respond better to stress and and the things outside of us but doing that within us rather than Uh relating relying on an external source you know so there's so much that goes with it and I just like I I have a like obviously like creating it like I have a very deep love for it but just like often seeing people come into the space and people are a little bit shy sometimes people like talking butts we're talking butts and genitals (laughs) yeah like we're talking butts we're talking about movement I mean for some people like movement is so unfamiliar we're talking about connecting into the body for some people that's like just never felt like the right thing to do you know and so you see people when they come in and they can be shy and they can be timid and they can be uncomfortable and you're just like you know what you don't have to have it all like sorted you don't have to like worry too much about the moves if you skip a breath who the fuck cares like you're here to like explore and just get with it and just get comfortable and you see people over like the period of like that hour and a half just like shift yeah and it's and and I think for me that's the thing which lights me up the most. If I see people leave and they're just like, that was amazing, that was so much fun. Like I feel like I'm more like confident in my body. I've had like people be like, I'm gonna have the best sex tonight. And I'm like, yeah, go and get it. Like, uh-huh. yeah, like <laughs> you know, I like take those moves and do what you need to with them, you yeah. know. And I love even on like um on social media just getting like random messages from people of like something that they've seen about twerking or whatever and they just send it to me and I'm just like oh I just love that like that people just think of think of like me when they're thinking of like these movements and they're just like oh this is like Adam and I'm like yes like honey we need to do this together you know like 
it's it's just really cool that it lights people up like yeah I, I think that's the thing and the fact that you have you have such a depth of knowledge. Like I know we haven't covered it on this podcast. And if you guys are listening and you're loving Adam, check out the other podcasts he's been on IO, for example, because he goes way more into his professional self. You have such a depth of knowledge and understanding of the way trauma works, how it's stored in the system, somatics, et cetera, et cetera. So you're bringing all of that depth and breadth into what appears to be just something that's super fun and super lighting up and super passionate, but it's got that depth. And, you know, if you're going to work through trauma, do you want to go sit in a, you know, a psychotherapist for an hour for 10 years or do you want to go twerking? <laughs> totally. And I think like this was also like the space that it was created from as well, because I've gone like really in depth with like dealing with some of that deep shit and just being very emotional. And I think there's a time and a place for that. And that's yeah. very necessary. But then I also feel like sometimes we get like forget that like we don't always have to be there. Yeah. And that, like, there is other ways to heal from trauma that are really, like, fun and uplifting uh-huh. and exciting. And yeah. that's what this is. It's like, yeah. as you said, it's like just taking everything that, like, is inside me that I'm aware of, that I know, and, and bringing it into a space where it is, like, uplifting. We don't need to, like, you know, hey, if you want to cry at work, we're fucking go for it. Like, I'm not going to stop you. But, like. Yeah, if, and you like, might. That's the yeah, cool thing about might. it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, but you know, if you're laughing and you're having fun, that's also really like, re- that's releasing a lot in yeah. it, in itself as well. So yeah. And as you pointed out, there's something around the collective body. When we come together as a group and we do this kind of work together as a group, there's a lot that's happening on the animal body level, the collective energetic body, et cetera. That's probably releasing a lot of shame or guilt that might be tied up around expressing in that way, except like, yes, it's not just about the individual healing, it's a collective healing that's happening as well. And my sense is that our ancestors did a lot of collective trauma healing, you know, chanting and and drumming and dancing around the fire and all those things. And so something like twerk work taps back into that collective way of healing together. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why for us, like, it's so important to have, like, yeah, that co- that community within Twerk Group. When we're doing it together, we're healing together. Yes, yeah. we're healing ourselves, but yes, we're healing each other all at the same time. And I think often we're each other's permission slips too, and we are, we are as you say, like, healing the, that shame or that guilt or that, you know, and we're returning back to, like, our, our familiar roots that we may not consciously be aware of. Yeah. So beautiful. All righty. So the last question I like to ask my guests, and this is a somatic experiencing kind of question. Um, So what I would love to know is what is your vision for what's coming, whether it's national, international, like what would you love to experience in this world, in this reality? I think definitely one thing that we already tapped on that I have like just always envisioned is open conversations without necessarily conflict them needing to be like turn into like an argument or or you know turn into emotional turbulence it's like we can be passionate about like our opinions and we can be really open to acknowledging and listening to someone else's perspective as well and to me to me that is a massive way forward in like Mm. our world like nationally internationally worldwide like just in, in existence like if we took that time and we stopped shutting each other down, we stopped, you know, going, well, their opinion is conflicting to mine, so I've got to, like, jump on that as soon as possible to defend my identity, it's like, yeah, like, together, and let's just chat, yeah, like, let's just listen, and chat, and listen, and chat, and, like, yes, yeah. like, that would be amazing. And on top of that, really like 
for, for those of us that are exploring and for those of the, those people that want to and wish to explore their own self healing and collective healing is that that passes down into waves of healing those of course in like before us but those like to come as well like our future like whether or not you choose to have kids or not have kids like all good but like just having a space like a big passion of mine is like youth because as someone who's been through a lot as a child mm. as a lot of us have it's like to me I'm like okay well how can we like give the tools and how can we support like the young ones to like grow up in a space where they're like us now you know where it yeah. where the, where the thing is it's like it's just normal to heal like mm. it's just normal to have these tools it's not like you had to go out and search for them or you had to decide to go on a healing journey it's like they're already on a healing journey you know we've already like integrated the tools and given it to them and given them the like a voice and done all of these things and they're like they grow up to be like like yeah big parts of like our society and like the change that gets to be made so yeah for mm. me that's so close to my heart as well so mm. I would say those two things I love those two things and so the just to summarize, I'm hearing you say is that your vision is that we have the capacity to hold robust conversations with passion where we love each other, even as we hold potentially different opinions and explore them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Ah, and then that you would love young people to grow up with awareness of and access to the tools and a recognition that this life is a healing journey in and of itself and it's just part of the dance <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Oh. may that be so yeah 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 Adam thank you so much for coming on the show so wholeheartedly and giving of yourself so generously um, and thank you so much for what you bring into the world I'm so looking forward to uh, seeing you on a dance floor sometime soon Yes, thank you so much for having me. Like, thank you so much for like the space that you create, um, and the voices that that are heard within the space. I th I think what you've created is really potent and really powerful. And so, I appreciate what what you're doing and what you continue to do. And the you know, mm. so yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Mm, my pleasure. So that was Adam Robertson of Twerk Work. Such a good conversation. Um, just really want to honor Adam's courage for naming some of the things. Like when I invited him to share, you know, some feedback on the transformational festivals, you know, as he said, it, it can be really hard to offer constructive feedback to a group when there's that sense of potentially being othered or kicked out or not liked because you're raising the thing you know you're you're saying the thing and people don't necessarily want to hear it and they might become defensive um so I just love the fact that Adam wanted was willing to to go the places that we went in that conversation and to explore the territory you know as humans we all have such a different experience of reality and it's shaped by you know our childhood our, our teenage years our young adult years and all the different factors that the avatar, you know, identifies with as such. Uh, you might notice if you go through the back catalogue of conversations with Karalia, I'm really interested in talking to people that have had diverse experiences of reality. I think it's really important because underneath it all, we all have beating hearts that love and we are all the same. We are all infinite expressions of the one consciousness showing up in a myriad of diverse forms so so much love to all of you thank you so much for listening as always please like follow and share and if there's someone that you would love to see as a guest on the show please feel free to reach out and suggest them if you would love to be a guest on the show reach out 
and uh, put yourself forward. So much love to you all. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karalia.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.